Okay, let's start. Let me see if everything is okay. Okay, so hello and welcome to the International Open Seminar on Semiotics, a tribute to John Dilley on the 50th anniversary of his passing. Whether you are watching us live now or watching the recording on YouTube, I would like to welcome you. This collaborative international open scientific initiative and celebration connects a network of those and of personalities and organizations coming from various environments and with different profiles, all working in unison towards the advancement and propagation of semiotic studies. Today, is the presentation, today's presentation is a holistic approach to semiotics, Yuri Lottman by Professor Dr. Marek Tam. Thank you, Professor Tam, for accepting our invitation. And we are also glad to receive here as the commentator of today's presentation, Professor Dr. John Tredenik Rowe. So thank you so much, Professor. I, I have to mention that after the presentation and the commentary, all people participating here on Zoom are welcome to share other commentaries, insights, and questions, okay? So I'd like to, to start by uh, introducing Professor Tam. Marek Tam is Professor of Cultural History at the School of Humanities in Tallinn University and Head of Tallinn University Center of Excellence in Intercultural Studies. His primary research fields are Cultural History of Medieval Europe, theory and history of historiography and cultural memory studies. He has recently published Cultural History of Memory in the Early Modern Age, co-edited with Alex Alessandro Arcange Arcangeli, Making Livonia, Actors and Networks in the Medieval and Early Modern Baltic Sea Region, co-edited with Anu Mant, Yuri Lotman, Culture, Memory and History, Essays in Cultural Semiotics, Rethinking Historical Time, New Approaches to Presentism, and Debating New Approaches to History. Uh, sorry, the, the, the last one, Rethinking Historical Time, was co-edited with Laurent Olivier, and Debating New Approaches to History, co-edited with Peter Burke. His most recent publishing project, project is The Companion to Yuri Lotman, A Semiotic Theory of Culture co-edited with Peter Torok. So, Professor, now you can start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for all participants. And of course, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the introduction. And I was indeed asked to give a talk about Yuri Lotman, one of the founding fathers of, of modern semiotics. And I'm very pleased to do so, especially because we are not celebrating this year only the fifth uh, anniversary of John Dealey's passing, but on also the hundreds years of, of, of uh, Yuri Lotman's birth. So I prepared a few slides. I will share my screen. And indeed, my take will be today to give you an idea of Lotman as a holistic uh, thinker. And I will explain in a minute what I have in mind with this. But let me start by the centenary we are celebrating because this has is an important uh, uh, project in Estonia and Russia and, and many other countries. And we also build a website that you can uh, have a better idea about various events taking place, very many of them uh, around the year. And, and of course, one of the highlights of, of this centenary was uh, International Congress, Yuri Lotman Semiosphere that took place uh, only a few weeks ago in Tallinn and in Tartu, and from 25th to 28th of February. And um, this uh, Congress brought together more than 300 participants from more than 30 countries, half of them uh, on site and the other half online. And uh, it was very yeah, productive uh, conference. And I hope that many publications uh, will follow. And so those who were not able to attend the conference, we also uploaded to Vimeo channel a selection of, of, the, of the online presentations and also all the plenary talks by Vika Ball, by 
uh, allied us, manned by Boris Uspensky, Boris Kasparov, and, and uh, Yuri Tsivyan. So you can still have some idea about the conference on this Vimeo uh, channel. But of course, this conference and, and the whole centenary was a trigger for quite many publications. And uh, I wanted to point out the book also already mentioned uh, by William, the companion, the Yuri Lotman, we edited together with my colleague at University of Tartu, Peter Torop, and the book launched uh, to place at uh, the conference in, in Tartu on the birthday of Yuri Lotman. And this is the very first attempt to offer kind of uh, interdisciplinary, international, comprehensive introduction uh, to Yuri Lotman's work. It is divided uh, into three parts. The first gives an overview of main context to understand Lotman's thinking. Second is about main concepts of Lotman. And the final part is a survey of Lotman's impact and, and potential in various disciplines across humanities, social sciences, and also natural and cognitive sciences. It, hopefully it will be an important guide for people interested in Lotman and, and, and reading English. And at the very end of the book, there is also the first comprehensive bibliography of Lotman's works in English and also of main works written about Lotman in English. And in this context, I wanted also to mention another book project I was involved with, came out a couple of years ago, which is a collection of Lotman's late essays in cultural semiotics in English translation. And so the idea behind the volume is to make his text more uh, easily accessible for, for non-Russian readers, for, for English speaker. Uh, audiences. So, and my talk today is very much based on these two books I've been working with over the last few years. But now, uh, let me start by a few preliminary uh, remarks about Lotman, how to approach the Lotman, uh, before I, I give you a short introduction to his, to his oeuvre. Um, I would call Lotman the opener, and actually this is a metaphor he used to use himself, dividing scholars into openers and closers, which comes close to another similar distinction by Isaiah Perlin between uh, foxes and hedgehogs. And so the openers are these kind of scholars who create new ideas, who open up new possibilities, new avenues for research, and who actually necessarily don't, uh, don't have to take advantage themselves of all the opportunities they have uh, made possible. Uh, whereas uh, closers uh, are, let's say, more systematic scholars who, who like to construct uh, sort of uh, metalinguistic systems or conceptual systems and offer comprehensive descriptions and often remain faithful to one big topic throughout their careers. So Lotman was a clear kind of paradigmatic opener. He was always after something new and, and always opening up new avenues, and I believe this is the main reason why his, his work is still so inspiring and, and remains an important source for contemporary semiotic research. But this also means that there is very hard to have a, let's say, single uh, um, consensual uh, profile of Lotman as a semiotician. I would even argue that we have many Lotmans uh, according to different authors different from different perspectives. And so today I will offer you one possible uh, interpretation of Lotman, one possible intellectual profile of Lotman, but I do admit that there are many other ways to make sense of Lotman and to consider him more like a scholar of Russian literature and culture than a semiotic uh, theoretician. And maybe another preliminary remark I wanted to emphasize is the very profoundly dialogic nature of Lotman's thinking. And of course, here he was clearly influenced by his important source of inspiration, Mikhail Bartin. But indeed, uh, for Lotman, the, 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 in the beginning, there was not one, but two, I would say, uh, as he claims in argues in this in his article, The Phenomenon of Culture from 1978. No cognitive structure can be unistructural or monolingual. Uh, uh, so um, in his understanding, uh, meaning can arise only as a result of relations between two or more different entities. 
And in human, in human life, everything begins with the need for dialogue. Uh, he puts it well in his 1990 book, Universe of the Mind. The need for dialogue, uh, for a dialogic situation, precedes both real dialogue and even the existence of language in which to conduct it. And also in more general terms, uh, Lotman was convinced that the evolution of culture, cultural dynamics is based on the principle of dialogism, that cultures are in constant dialogue with both their contemporaries and their past. So dialogue is the fundamental character of, of all semiosis, of all semiosphere. So these two characteristics, opener and, and dialogic thinker, I think are in, essential in, in in better understanding Lodman's way of, 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 of thinking. So one can ask, uh, what was Lotman about? What, what was the main question he was you know, trying to address in his life, in his work? Uh, and I would claim that his life work was to conceptualize in semiotic terms, the human world, including the human mind. And he was actually, I believe, fully aware about this, uh, his, his penchant to semiotizing everything in human uh, life. In his Universe of the Mind book, he compares all semioticians, including himself, to King Midas, who turned into gold everything he touched with his golden hand. And, and so also all semioticians uh, uh, semiotize everything they, they touch upon. And, and Lotman was indeed semiotizing uh, the human world, making it, translating it into semiotic uh, terms. Now, what is maybe important to emphasize that in this work of semiotization, Lotman was on the one hand truly systematic and, and comprehensive. However, as we just uh, said, never aimed to build a formalized meta language or develop a system of, of concepts. Uh, one could say that Lotman semiotics has its own method, but almost no terminology. So it remained open there, even being a systematic semiotization, a semiotic uh, scholar. This also means that Lotman's work does not represent a unified doctrine, uh, but a certain way of basing structure and systemicity in various meaning making processes. And this also means that Lotman rarely wrote anything purely theoretical. Most of his theories emerge from concrete empirical case studies, observations, and therefore his semiotic theories can be considered as ad hoc theories. And it's up to his, uh, up to us to, to, to develop these ad hoc theories into more uh, systematic uh, approach like I'm trying to do today. Now, uh, my central argument, as I said in the title, is that Lotman's approach to semiotic can be characterized as holistic. Um, it uh, presumes that the whole precedes the parts, the general precedes the particular. And in order to study elementary parts, one must first study complex systems. Uh, and I would even argue that uh, Lotman's hol holism is not only epistemological, but also ontological. The associations between the elements are not mere constructs devised by the investigator, the scholar, but exist in the human world itself, and, and, and the human world itself constitutes an integral system. <clears throat> so this is the key argument. Uh, and, and I would even make another uh, switch on it, namely Lotman's holistic uh, ontological attitude is also organicist or organic, if you like. Uh, that this uh, idea of, of a world uh, being holistic uh, means also that it is kind of not mechanical system, but a living harmonious and dynamic uh, system. And we can see indeed, uh, especially in the late uh, work of Lotman, that he uses various uh, biological metaphors. Uh, for instance, in the article on the semiosphere from 1983, he says that all semiotic space may be regarded as, as a mechanism, if not organism. And, and this idea of, 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 of 
semiosphere as a, as a gigantic organism uh, is is um, can be often met in his in his uh, uh, in his work. Now, to understand Lotman's holistic uh, thinking, uh, we need to introduce, I think, what I could call the core principle of Lotman's theoretical thinking, namely the principle of cultural isomorphism. Uh, to quote Alexei Semenenko, who has written quite a lot about Lotman's cultural isomorphism, uh, this postulates that all semiotic entities from individual consciousness to the totality of human culture are based on similar heterogeneous mechanisms of meaning generation. Uh, so even if uh, Lotman uh, considered all, let's say, semiotic unities we we're talking about in a minute, text, culture, semiosphere, as, as complex and heterogeneous and multilingual phenomena, he always emphasized that these isolated elements were mutually isomorphic and made up a coherent uh, whole. Uh, it was very interesting to notice that this idea of cultural isomorphism is an old idea in Lotman's thinking. And only early this year mm, was published a Lotman's correspondence from the years of, of the Second World War from, from early 40s. As you might remember, he was participating as a soldier in the, in, the, uh, in the Second World War. And he had quite a large correspondence with his family members, his sisters and, 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 and parents. And one can see that already in 1945, Lotman sort of discovers, uh, or, or, or at least first time uh, writes down is this idea of, of cultural isomorphism. So he wrote to his sister, Lydia, uh, that, that he sees every period in history as, a, as an organism. And any part of which is impossible to understand without understanding the whole. And the whole cannot be understood without understanding an extremely large number of, of parts. So it was quite surprising being like uh, 23 years old, he already had this idea, this holistic idea, and always this organi organi organicist uh, holistic idea of, of history and then of, of culture. Uh, but we can find the same idea throughout his, his, his works. And for instance, in his, one of his last books that was published uh, posthumously in 1994, uh, Conversation on Russian Culture, on the very final page of the book, he uh, says that history reflected in one person in his life and Chester is isomorphic to the history of humankind. They are reflected in one another and are comprehended through one another. So almost exactly 50 years later, the same idea. And, and there is an, an interesting sort of persistence in this, in this thinking in this regard. Uh, but we can continue. Uh, for instance, another uh, important uh, book of Lotman, uh, the, the biography of Nikolai Karamzin, The Creation of Karamzin, published in 1987. He, he, he says, just as the fate of Hamlet or Othello, which takes only a few hours of stage time, is similar and equivalent to the fate of all humankind. So the fate of one culture figure is equal in significance to the fate of the entire culture as a whole. And another variation, more and more abstract terms from uh, his probably the latest book that was published only 2010 in Russian and 2013, in English, the unpredictable workings of culture, he says, the isomorphism between the whole and its part means that and part in isolation and the parts together are the certain three alike. So again, this uh, sort of uh, idea of, of, of interconnected, interconnectedness between parts and, and, and wholes. And yeah, to conclude this series of examples, uh, another interesting metaphor from his um, article on the semiosphere in 1984, he says that just as by sticking together individual stakes, we don't obtain a cough, but by cutting up a cough, we may obtain stakes. In summing separate semiotic acts, we don't obtain a semiotic universe. On the contrary, 
Only the existence of such a universe, the semiosphere, makes the specific sign act real. Um, so Merseys is very clear. We always should take into account first the, the most general before we start making sense of the most uh, particular. It is interesting to note that Umberto Eco, when he introduced uh, uh, Lotman's uh, monograph, Universe of the Mind for um, English-speaking readers, uh, offers a different comparison, uh, as he says, for those squeamish readers unwilling to consider art and culture in terms of calves and raw meat. So he uses a um, metaphor of, of, of branches and leaves and, and the forest. So he says that if you put together branches and great quantity of leaves, we cannot understand the forest. But if we would, how, we will, out of, um, yeah, sorry, we'll have to uh, make a little, yes, it's better, right, like. So if we, but if you know how to walk through the forest of culture with our eyes open, confidently following the numerous parts which crisscross it, not only shall we be able to understand better the vastness and complexity of the forest, but we shall also be able to discover nature of the leaves and branches of every single tree. So that's very much Lotten's thinking in a nutshell. But now, having made this central argument about the uh, uh, holistic uh, thinking and, and cultural isomorphism of Lotman, let me um, present his thinking in, in main concepts and, and kind of describe the conceptual development of, of, of Lotman. And I would argue that we can uh, reduce his conceptual development to the sequence of language, from language to text, from text to culture, from culture to semiosphere. And this is kind of code how to read Lotman. Uh, and what is interesting that this sequence, on the one hand, indeed represents the evolution of Lotman's conceptual thinking, moving from the particular to the general, but indeed started by, by exploring language, next text, then culture, and ended up by his theory of semiosphere. But on the other hand, I would argue that all these elements of this sequence were always present in the thinking from the beginning. Uh, so this isomorphic thinking, as we, we saw, uh, was characteristic to Lotman at least since early 40s. And all, all, also these concepts, language, text, culture, and semiosphere, were in Lotman's mind as a kind of, was a kind of isomorphic series, uh, which all elements are mutually connected and independent. Uh, when you can put it also differently that this sequence can be read both diachronically and synchronically. It, it characterizes the development of his thinking, but also the structure of his thinking. So, uh, indeed, Lotman's semiotic theory uh, started in the early 60s from the realization that, in a semiotical sense, culture is a multi-language or polyglot system, where, in parallel to natural languages, there exist secondary modeling systems, kind of secondary languages like mythology, ideology, ethics, etc. And these secondary modeling systems are based on first uh, modeling systems, meaning natural languages. Or the secondary modeling systems might employ natural languages for the description or explanation, like in the case of music or palais, or also they, these, natural, these secondary modeling systems can use natural languages uh, in the form of analogization, uh, talking about language of theater, language of film, language of painting, etc. In 1970, in his articles about cultural typology, Lotman says, defining culture as a science system subjected to structural rules allows us to view it as a language in the general semiotic sense of the term. So Lotman's main work in the 1960s was actually to analyze different uh, cultural languages and, and describe different uh, 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 um, aspects of culture as language. Now, next, in, in late 1960s, Lotman introduced another concept, the notion of text. Uh, and um, text is for Lotman on the other hand, just a manifestation of language, 
like a written language. But on the other hand, and this is important, text is for Lottmann also itself a mechanism that creates languages. So in some cases, first there is a text and then there is a language. And this concept of text uh, became particularly important for Lottmann because it helped to define his object of research. Because on the one hand, it referred to natural textual objects, book, but also picture, symphony, very pounded clear science systems, but also to textualizable objects. And he started to talk about culture as text, everyday behavior as text, biography as text, so in a way he was textualizing the human world uh, as it were. So text for Lottmann is any science system that has integral meaning and integral function. And uh, one can say that in, in, in late 1960s and in early 1970s, Lottmann was developing the principles of immanent textual analysis in various cultural uh, domains, from, from literature to arts and, and, and film studies and etc. Now, the important shift from text to culture uh, already started in late 60s and, and culminated in early 70s. Uh, and um, for Lotman, it was important that even if we consider culture as text, doesn't mean that culture is, is static, is, is sort of uh, clearly defined and, and, and uh, sort of synchronic uh, phenomenon. Together with Boris Ospensky, his close friend and colleague, uh, they explain in the article on the semiotic mechanisms of culture, culture can be presented as an aggregate of texts. However, from the point of view of the researcher, it is more exact to consider culture as a mechanism creating an aggregate of texts and texts as the realization of culture. So here we can see that he's more interested in the dynamics of culture and the, in the creation of, of culture as texts. And he indeed compares culture to a kind of giant mechanism of text generation that constantly translates non-cultural messages into cultural texts. And here we can see how his understanding of culture, the key concept of his next uh, uh, phase of work, grows out of his concept of, of text. Uh, symbolically, we could argue that the year 1970 is the critical year uh, after which uh, he focuses uh, to the study of culture. And we can see that the small collection of articles published in 1970, studies in the typology of culture, is the first um, attempt to develop a new culture theory or semiotics of culture. And, and a more systematic attempt was made together with Pospensky uh, in 1971. Probably something important to keep in mind that Lottmann's uh, conception of culture is heavily influenced by cybernetics and information sciences that were particularly influential in, in 1960s in, in Soviet Union and in the rest of the world. Therefore, we can easily see that Lottmann's understanding of culture is, is, departs from this uh, information theory. And, and for Lottmann, culture is first and foremost uh, an extensive and elaborate system of creating, processing and preserving information. In 1970, he proposes a prelimin preliminary definition of culture as the sum of all non-hereditary information and the means of its organization and preservation. But a more developed definition together with Uspensky was proposed a year later in the famous article on the semiotic mechanism of culture, where they say that they understand culture as the non-hereditary memory of the community, memory expressing itself in a system of constraints and, and prescriptions. So it is important, I will not I will not dwell on this, but this mnemonic aspect of culture remains very important uh, for Lottmann, and he was one of the first scholars of, of cultural memory studies, as we are discovering quite recently. But the culture wasn't the final stop for Lottmann, uh, and his uh, theory of culture uh, became more and more interested in cultural dynamics, especially in late 70s and, and early 80s. 
and uh, uh, this is also the period where he was increasingly interested in unpredictable mechanism of culture and in the cultural explosions, as he called them. He, he penned a book called Culture and Explosion. Uh, it came out in, 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 in early 90s. And, and this interest in, in unpredictable, dynamic uh, and explosive um, nature of culture uh, kind of logically led him to develop his theory of, of, of semiosphere. Uh, and as much as we know, he first publicly uh, coined the concept in 1982, uh, but the, the key article was published in 1984 on the semiosphere. And uh, in this article, he claims that uh, uh, like uh, biosphere is the prerequisite for human life or the semiosphere is prerequisite for human life, for human communication, for human uh, semiosis. As he says, the semiosphere is that same semiotic space outside of which semiosis itself cannot exist. So according to Lottmann, human culture constitutes a kind of global semiosphere but this global semiosphere is highly heterogeneous and complex uh, system. And it consists uh, of intertwined semiosphere of different times. So there is a diachrony of semiosphere. There is a different semiosphere developing in time, but also the synchrony of semiosphere, the semiosphere at different levels. So he also, uh, in another article, uh, makes a parallel with the Leibniz monadology, that the semiospheres are like a monad, and, and there's many, many semiosphere like there is many monads, but these uh, uh, semiotic monads are with windows, they are in connection with other uh, monads, other semiotic monads, and therefore are forming an interconnected um, whole. But here also, in the case of semiosphere, we, we, we see that Lotman continues to use this isomorphic uh, thinking. He claims that each semisphere can be analyzed as a single whole, yet we need to bear in mind that each analyzed whole in culture is a part of a greater whole. At the same time, every whole consists of parts which are legitimate wholes on, the, on their own, which in turn consists of parts and so on. So there is this kind of infinite dialogue of wholes and parts and, and the whole semiosphere consists of this dynamics of, of whole and parts. And, and uh, not a single part can be understood without the whole, and the whole cannot be understood without the parts. So uh, this was uh, very much my uh, attempt to summarize Lotman's thinking. On the one hand, arguing that Lotman is holistic thinking, organicist, uh, um, uh, holistic thinking and and this holistic thinking is based on the principle of cultural isomorphism on the principle that whole and part are sort of dialectically connected and on the other hand i want i, I try to um, describe the development of lotman's thinking from particular the general from language and text to culture and, and semiosphere while keeping in mind that all these elements were in place, I would argue, in Lotman's thinking, at least since the uh, 1940s. But I'd like to conclude by a couple of, of general remarks, uh, uh, as I started with a couple of general remarks. Mm, I think an important thing to keep in mind uh, about Lotman is that for him, culture and semiotics are essentially co-extensive phenomena. Culture is by nature semiotics, and semiotics evolves in a cultural environment. And in this respect, uh, semiotics is always, first and foremost, a cultural semiotics or semiotics of culture. And all other branches of semiotics uh, sort of grow out of this uh, cultural uh, semiotics. And secondly, uh, I think another other major characteristic of Lodman thinking is that he believes cultures have a natural capacity of self-description and self-interpretation. Um, and, and this also means that the more different descriptions of culture there is, the richer uh, the culture. 
Uh, and what is important also that uh, for Lotman also every analysis of culture, including semiotics of culture, is, is part of culture's self-analysis, of culture's self-interpretation. And therefore, the main reason for our analysis of culture, for all cultural uh, disciplines, is to ensure uh, for that culture the ability of self-cognition, of self-interpretation. And this idea is all, all already present in the famous theses on the semiotic study of culture that Lotman wrote together with his close colleagues, Uspensky, Bietigorsky, Ivanov, and Toprov in 1973, where they claim that, um, that the scientific investigation is not only an instrument uh, for uh, the study of culture, but also part of its object. Scientific texts being metatexts of the culture may at the same time be regarded as its text. Therefore, any significant scientific idea may be regarded both as an attempt to cognize culture and as a fact of its life through which its generating mechanism take effect. In other words, also scientific research, including semiotic research, is part of culture and, and, and contribute to the uh, uh, cultural self-interpretation. That's the ultimate reason for disciplines like cultural semiotics uh, to exist. So this was my uh, probably too short introduction to Lotman's thinking. I'm grateful for your attention and I will now uh, hand it over to, to John. Thank you, Professor Merik Tam. So let me introduce Professor John and then he can uh, start his commentary. So, Professor John Kretnicki Rowe. For two days a week, John Kretnicki Rowe works at the Penn Arc as a research fellow in complex interventions. His interests predominantly relate to qualitative health services research, but also extend to medical education, assessment, semiotics, police evaluation, and trails research methods. For three days a week, he is the project development manager for a digital health incubator, setting up a test bed network for primary care related trials of digital health solutions, including apps, wearables, kiosks, etc. Previously, he worked as a post doctoral researcher on a number of projects associated with the Department of Health and General Medical Council. He has managed a European Regional Development Fund project that focused on developing innovative solutions to aging related conditions with small and medium enterprises. Much of his work, both predoctoral pre and postdoctoral, has, has focused on co production of research with local healthcare organizations, public, private, and third sector. John, Tredenik Rowe has an interest in many different qualitative methodologies for ethnography, interviewing, and focus groups. In addition, he has conducted systematic reviews in medical education and continue to be interested in method methodological innovations in review work. He's an honorary research fellow at Exeter Medical School and runs his own private research consultancy that focuses on innovation, commercialization, and knowledge exchange for clinical companies. So thank you, Professor John Tredenik Rowe. And you can start your commentary and dialogue with Professor Merck Tapp. Great, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I think we first wanna say just a big thank you for Professor Tam. That was that was really fascinating. I feel like we had a, a whistle stop tour through the life of Yuri Lotman. It covered all the, you know, the points. And I know it's always hard to fit everything you want to within you know, 45 minutes, but it was a real nice journey through the sequence of his thinking. I think it was it was lovely to follow the follow the trajectory. Um, <clears throat> I have naturally when you listen to something and it really piques your interest, you have lots of questions, but I don't want to be just the only voice. I'm sure we'll open up to other people to it. It's, it's nice to have a dialogue rather than a monologue for my part, of course. Um, I mean, there's a few things that jumped out of me. And one of the things was I, I will also take the take the moment to advertise. Hopefully it won't blur it out, but um, there you go. Hopefully you can see the book, if I can call it that. I need to take the screen off that you um, co-edited. One of the things that really jumped out to me about the his 
Lockman's work is, I, as you heard from the introduction, come from a more of a sort of medical and healthcare related background. So I can spot the evolutionary and uh, to use the word organicist again, uh, motifs that come out in it. it. For me, it's fascinating. It almost looks like he had the, the parallel model and you spoke about the paper you wrote on, uh, on, on biosphere where he made the comparison to semi-sphere to biosphere. To what extent do you think the culture that he was in um, in you know in, in his in his university was influencing him because in, in this book I held it up for a reason there's also a, a chapter by Professor Kalevi Cole where he talks about Lotman and his uh, interaction with biosciences do you know that do you think there was this sort of um, quote unquote hard science influence on him that produced this what to my mind looks like a you know like a borrowing from evolutionary models and biological models but translated into culture and cultural history yeah, actually, I, I believe it goes back to his uh, youth, though, because uh, uh, we know that Lotman's first vocation was to become a biologist, or rather, most precisely, ent entomologist. And and it just later that he turned to what humanities and, 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 and literary studies. But this was kind of first feeling that he wants to study nature. And I think this, this remained with him. And it also... It, Interesting to note that one of his uh, sons, he had three sons, one of his sons is a professional biologist. Ah. And, and therefore, I believe also in conversation with his son, he was, I believe, uh, rather well informed about uh, some ideas circulating in, in, in biology. But of course, you are right that, uh, especially in his later life, he was contacted by this emerging group of Tartu biosemiticians and mm -hmm. theoretical biologists like Kalevi Quill, and and also probably received some you know impact uh, from their side, and I mentioned that that Lotman first uh, uh, publicly announced the idea of semiosphere in 1982, and it took place in a summer school of of, of theoretical biologists, and and uh, and that was organized by Galevi Quill. So there is some yeah connections, but of course for this idea of semiosphere important source of inspiration was Vladimir Vernatsky, the famous Russian uh, scientist. Mm -hmm. And so it was also by reading that he, he caught this idea of, of, of semiosphere as an analog to, to biosphere. But indeed, I believe that, um, I, I'm not sure so much that he was in, in sort of uh, close contact with his colleagues at the University of Tartu and the Department of, of Natural Sciences, except a few cases I mentioned. But, but yeah, I think something even deeper, and he remained sort of organ organicist, I think, uh, from, from early on. Hmm. I think one of the, the bits that's, that's great for me, and you touched on the, the point that um, you know, lots of people have found value in, in his work. For me, from coming from a, so I, I specialize mainly in, in medical semiotics, but you have to read widely. You, I love the theory, but it's so accessible for me coming from what is essentially, you would call it uh, more of a, you know, um, not traditional humanities background to look at the way he made descriptions and it bits like jump out to me. So I'm just going to pick a, a couple just to, of interest. So, I mean, the whole concept of isomorphism exists in other scientific disciplines, for example, and you can make very clear predicates to how evolution works from a culture and a biological bit. But one of the bits I think really um, that was interesting for me, just as a, a sort of point was his Lotman's idea about equipossibility that was a, a particularly interesting one and um i work some of the work i do relates to clinical trials a trial of novel drugs and other things like that as well and it, it's it's really funny because i was looking up the reference earlier it's only in 1987 uh the concept of what we call equipoise was introduced to trials where you had to have genuine um what would you call it uncertainty in the trial of one drug against the other or of one product against the other. And it was seen as this is the very fundamental basis of drug trials is that there is a lack of certainty. Because if you know what you've got, then it's not really a trial and you can't tell if one is better than the other. And it led to me doing some you know, digging in the past about Lotman's idea about predictability and all of that. And I really made a twig that he's almost got a, a philosophical theory of trials before the trialists came up with this idea, which is I find, again, it, it, it interacts at a level that's really accessible for me, even though the uh, things you may not think, like uh, Uri Lotman and clinical trials may not be seen as natural bedfellows, but it's so open and accessible, it actually does work for me, which is one of the, um, 
one of the things I love about it, but I am coming to the point which I wanted to make it, which I, in getting to very slowly, is that he seemed to hit upon theories before other people, particularly, I mean, I, I can't read Russian, but you'll, you'll see an idea that he published and the, then you'll read the year of it and you think, okay, this came out in English 10, 20 years after he hit on it. You know, um, I guess you called it an opener, but I mean, you, you mentioned the... Um, the you know the kind of ad hoc theories that came up with it. but do you agree he seemed to hit on ideas and he wouldn't necessarily follow them and then 10 years later in an English text someone else will try and put their hat over it and say I've come up with this linguistical cultural theory yeah definitely I think this is what makes his reading so rewarding that mm. you can always discover new ideas that are still not you know picked up by the others and and uh, uh, in this respect, uh, you know, to use the Umberto Eco's concept, the open work. I mean, his his work is very much open and 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 remains to be discovered in in in, in major parts. Especially, indeed, uh, still the majority of his work is not available in English, mm. and and uh, there remains a lot to to be discovered. But as I yeah, as I started, I believe he was somebody who was kind of kind of flowing with ideas having kind of constant flow of ideas and and he and that's why also his favorite genre was essay he, he wrote not that many monographs but he as was mostly producing essays because this is the most you know convenient form how to convey your you know fresh ideas and to kind of address them to, 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 to others so i do I agree and and you know it's even interesting that you might keep re rereading the same text for many times and you still discover new ideas. So it remains open in, at, at very different levels. Yeah. I also thought, I mean, again, because it, it was such a nice tour of the, of the man's ideas. Um, what do you think, is there anything that jumps out of you as the most appropriate application of Lotman today in a more contemporary setting? Any culture, particular cultural or historical issues that you think well, he, this is a space where we need to be looking at and using him yeah on the one on the one hand i would say that there's plenty of them and and the last uh, part of the companion tries to demonstrate his relevance and potentiality in various disciplines but to pick up one particular example i think lotman is a particularly useful guide in making sense of our digital age mm. and also some of my colleagues in Tallinn university have published uh, recently a book called digital semiosphere and it seems indeed that this, uh, again, this kind of isomorphic thinking and this, this holistic thinking is particularly suitable for digital world, which is also deeply interconnected and, and where you cannot make sense of part without the whole and, and vice versa. And I think there is a lot to do in order to really apply uh, Lotman's thinking to contemporary digital condition of, of, of human life. Mm. And, and yeah, this is probably one of the most prospective avenues for research, let's say digitize uh, Lotman and, mm. and, and, and use it. Because of course he was an analog person. He would never used internet in his life or, or any of those new gadgets, but nevertheless, his, his theories, I believe are perfectly suitable for analyzing the, our new digital condition. I think what's lovely about it as well is um, you can think about things like uh, multimodal semisphere. So you can take Gunter Kress and his work and other people that work in multimodality and kind of build it into this bigger framework that he's given to you, you know, that it's really integral, integrative to fit things in, which I, I really appreciate it. And um, I just find it fun. It gives you a space to play in theoretically and sort of intellectually, which I, I enjoy a lot. Um, it did even make me think again, because one of the, the things that I uh, remember from, again, delving into the text was he, correct me if I'm wrong, he had a, um, I think, I won't call it a theory of fear. What was it? It was, um, uh, there was a better word, hysteria, I think. Was that correct? I think he had, a, it almost made me think there's space for sort of Yuri Lotman's culture and pandemic related work as well, you yeah. know, as media and in the use of communication with COVID. So, Whilst, you know, he, again, it's, it's interesting because he came from quite a different space, a different time period, but yet, there you go, you've almost on a plate, you could serve up a really interesting piece of analysis about uh, the role of communication. And I think it was mass hysteria that he, he wrote about as well. And um, sort of... Uh, yes, he, was, he, he tried to develop in the 80s a whole theory of, of, of semiotics of fear and, and, and semiotics of emotions. 
And of course, uh, on a very deep level, fear is a semiotic phenomenon. You, you are basically fearing, uh, you know, uh, things that necessarily doesn't exist. It's only um, in the semiotic presence of, of, of some thing you are uh, fear about. But uh, I believe indeed that, uh, that there is a parallel between, uh, uh, let's say, late 80s, early 90s, uh, but, but also very turbulent times and, and, and the collapse of Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. And, and Lotman, I see, try to make sense of this, uh, this kind of time of, of unpredictability and uh, explosive times, etc. And now, of course, uh, you know, 30 years later, we are living another mostly most un- unpredictable and, and difficult times, being yeah. a, a pandemics of war, etc. And I believe that Lotman is still very useful, actually, to, to make sense of these, these moments of unpredictability and these moments of, of, of fears and these moments of, of, of mass hysteria. And, and therefore, yeah, I think the, the current context gives an extra relevance to his, his late book. Mm. No, I, I agree. It, again, it's um, what makes it so accessible, isn't it? I think... Um... It, it, yeah, I um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think yeah, th- those are the main things that jumped out. Um, I hope they that they've been useful. I'll be very happy to open it up for other people to jump in with other questions or anything else anyone wants to to join in or don't want to dominate the conversation too much. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you for this brief dialogue. So we are going to close the broadcast on YouTube now, but we will stay here on Zoom. The floor is open to the audience. You can ask questions, share commentary.